so good morning good afternoon good evening everyone welcome you all to the megra hill author master class and thank you very much for taking out time from your busy schedule please feel free to ask any question that you have through the q and a tab we will answer all the questions at the end of the session today's topic is a very relevant and interesting one which is sglt2 inhibitors sweet success for the diabetic heart and kidney this session will cover sglt2 inhibitors advantages ql analytics hypothesis and therapeutic ketosis we have our esteemed speaker dr sundar mudaliyar i am glad to have the privilege of giving a brief introduction about him Professor Sundar Madhuryar is trained in India, England, and the United States. He is currently a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California in San Diego, and a board-certified endocrinologist. Dr. Madhuryar is active in seeing patients and teaching, and has focused his research on the clinical aspects of diabetes and its complications. He is an investigator in several ongoing landmark studies, including the NIH GRADE study, NIH Diabetes Prevention Program Outcome Study, and the NIH DCCT and EDIC study. Dr. Mudaliyar has published more than two hundred original articles in peer-reviewed journals. We are really glad to have you today. and thanks for your time and over to you dr mudaliya all right um good evening to you everybody or good day to you uh thank you for the kind introduction and thank you all for taking time off to attend this uh, presentation i will be talking on a subject which is really near and dear to my heart for the past 15 years as due to two inhibitors and how i think it is really sweet success for the diabetic heart and the diabetic kidney first of all my conflict of interest disclosures i i am a speaker for astrazeneca but i will not be promoting any specific products i do get research support from the national institutes of health for the three studies on which i am the great study the diabetes prevention program which is in its 30th year and the, the diabetes control and complication trial is in its 40th year so many of you may not even be as old as the studies are so what am i going to present today first of all i will review the nature of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and the classical view always has been is it's atherosclerosis there's a plaque in the vessel you know coronary vessel cerebral vessel and it's due to a combination of dyslipidemia hypertension hyperglycemia i will make the point that there is another view as well and that is myocardial and renal tissue hypoxia at the level of the tissue independent of atherosclerosis as you know there are some kinds of you know the cardiologists call it minoca that is myocardial infarction with non obstructive coronary arteries so how did you get a myocardial infarction when the coronary arteries are not obstructed so there's a lot of inflammation hypoxia and oxidative stress going on over there then i will discuss the effects of the sglt2 inhibitors versus the glp1 receptor agonists on cardiovascular disease and diabetes as you know these are the two classes of drugs which in the recent studies have shown profound benefits on cardiovascular disease and i'll tell you what i think about the two of them together i feel that the glp1 receptor agonists their effects on mainly on atherosclerotic cvd on the pipe the coronary artery the uh, you know the cerebral arteries the peripheral vascular arteries over there whereas the sglt2 one inhibitors they work on the pump not the pipe the pump and that's the myocardial and renal function because as you know the, the heart is a pump and the kidney has got two 
parts to it. It's got a filter, which is the glomerulus, but the work is actually being done by the tubules. They are pumping. The filter takes out all the plasma, all the glucose, all the sodium. The tubule is the pump that has to push it all back in, depending on the metabolic state. And finally, I will describe this concept of therapeutic ketosis, which has become very popular with all the low-carb diets, the intermittent fasting, but I will focus on therapeutic ketosis to treat heart failure in diabetes. We all know this famous slide, you know, the complex pathophysiology of, uh, you know, diabetes and Ralph de Franz, of course, has popularized it and he has called it the ominous octet. We have defects in all these organs, the kidney, the pancreas, the liver, the muscle, the brain, the adipose tissue, the intestine, all of them contribute to hyperglycemia. And you know all these defects at the level of the different organs. That's the bad news. The good news is we have drugs which can act on all these defects, SGLT2 inhibitors on the kidney, sulfonylurea and glenides and the incretins on the pancreas, metformin, of course, and the TZDs on the liver and the muscle. Bromocryptine, which is approved in the, in the United States, actually acts on dopaminergic signaling in the brain. Of course, metformin and TZDs also act on adipose tissue and the incretins and the alpha glucosidase inhibitors and colocebulam act on the gut. Let's not forget insulin, 100 years old. What do all these drugs do? Well, they lower blood glucose levels. We know that. But we found out over the years through many studies, actually the uh, ACCORD study, the advanced study, the VA diabetes study, which I also did in the, in the early 2000s, tight glucose control improves microvascular complications, but has no effect on cardiovascular disease. And perhaps as seen in the ACCORD trial, it might be harmful. Uh, let me remind you that the ACCORD trial was stopped by the NIH early, six months early, because there was more cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality in the tight glucose control group. Now, this is a little odd that there is increased cardiovascular mortality because one of the definitions from diabetes from Miles Fisher in Glasgow, he says diabetes should be defined as premature cardiovascular death, which occurs about five to 10 years earlier than people without diabetes. Even if you account for smoking, age, cholesterol, hypertension. So premature cardiovascular disease associated with chronic hyperglycemia and may also be associated with blindness and renal failure. So the crux of diabetes is premature cardiovascular disease. But we have taken the glucocentric approach all these years till recently, because if the blood sugar goes up, you have diabetes, it causes complications. So if you lower the blood glucose, maybe that'll help. It does help microvascular uh, complications because it improves retinopathy and it also improves albuminuria. It regresses albuminuria, but really has no effect on progression to dialysis, on progression to end-stage kidney disease. And as I said before, glucose control per se has no effect on CVD and may be harm as seen in the ACCORD study. Now, when we think of CVD, what do we think of? We think of myocardial infarction, strokes, and death to, due to an MI or a stroke. And this is what's called the classical MACE, which is major adverse cardiovascular events. But CVD, as we all know, is much more than MACE. Heart failure is a very important component of CVD, especially in diabetes over there, and even without diabetes. And this is an article from a good friend of mine, David Bell. Almost 20 years ago, he said heart failure is the frequent, forgotten, and often fatal complication of diabetes. And he said diabetes, and he said heart failure is highly prevalent in patients with diabetes and occurs in more than one in five patients about the age of 65. And this, if you go looking for it, it's there. And unfortunately, people with diabetes and heart failure. If a patient with diabetes is admitted with heart failure, the prognosis is actually quite poor. 
with a median survival of four years. And this is in the Medicare database in the United States, because about the age of 65, all people in the United States come under Medicare, so they have good data. And this is even worse than the survival of some cancers. Now, this was about a decade ago, and things have improved. But I'm making the point, heart failure is quite a bad disease to have in patients with heart with diabetes. And it occurs very early. How early? Well, this was a study which looked at left ventricular function in patients with type 2 diabetes. It was done in Italy and at academic center, multi-center study. And what they did was they took 386 people who came into their clinic, a cardiology clinic. They had type 2 diabetes about five years. Their A1C was 7%. And these people had stress testing and had no ischemia. So normally we would say, yeah, these people don't have cardiovascular disease, but they did echoes on them. And they found that almost 70% of these patients had LV dysfunction. They have diabetes only less than five years. A1C is less than seven. And it's a combination of systolic, diastolic, and, or, and dysfunction. And only about a third of them had normal LV function. Now we all know, that the heart and the kidney talk to each other in different ways. And if you have a disorder of one, it is going to lead to a disorder of the other. And as we know, patients with CKD will die of heart disease, then go on to end-stage kidney disease. And if you see the rate per 100 patient years, people with kidney disease going on to transplant or dialysis is 0 0.5 per 100 patient years six times as many people before they get there, they will unfortunately die of heart disease, heart failure. And this actually in recent years led to a rethinking on cardiorenal complications in diabetes. First of all, we put it together, and this is from Navid Sattar in the UK and Darren McGuire in the US. What did they say? This is an editorial in circulation. For decades, the cardiac risks of type two diabetes has been selectively focused on incremental atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. But the Emperor outcome study forced us to reconsider and expand our notions of the risk pathways leading to specific complications, specifically CV death, heart failure, and kidney disease. So all the big societies said, let's move away from just MACE. Let's look at cardiorenal complications, including heart failure. What did we learn from the CVOTs, the cardiovascular outcome trials? Well, this is what we found. DPP4 inhibitors, they're good drugs, they're used all over the world. But if you look at the CVOTs, they have no MACE benefits, no heart failure benefits, and their renal benefits is to reduce albuminuria, no effects on progression to end-stage kidney disease. GLP-1 receptor agonists, yes, we have MACE benefits. But as of today, no heart failure benefits in dedicated studies. Real benefits, again, decrease in albuminuria. And really, as of today, in, as a primary outcome, no effects on progression to end-stage kidney disease. Of course, meta-analysis and all show it, but those are hypothesis generating. And no, we're waiting for the studies. They're going to come. The sole study will come in two years' time. SGLT2 inhibitors, on the other hand, have got MACE benefits, have got CHF benefits, and they prevent people from going on to get end-stage kidney disease, which I think is a profound benefit, which about five years ago, we couldn't even think of this. Now, how do they two compare to each other, GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT-2? Nobody will ever do a study head-to-head -head and spend million, hundreds of millions of dollars. So the best we can get is in a meta-analysis. This is a really good one from Zelnicker et al. And what did they say? They said in trials to date, GLP-1s and SGLT-2s reduce atherosclerotic mace, that's the pipe, to a similar degree in patients who have established cardiovascular disease. They've had an MI, they've had a stroke. However, except of course in the Virtus study for SGLT2s, whereas SGLT2 inhibitors have marked effect on preventing hospitalization for heart failure and preventing progression of kidney disease. So this was a nice uh, 
uh, editorial written by Verma, he said, GLP-1 receptor agonist CV benefits are due to anti-atherosclerotic effects on the pipe, the vessels. And this is due to a variety of factors. A1C improves, blood pressure, GLP-1s cause a lot of weight loss, lipids improve, anti-inflammatory effects, and endothelial effects. GLP-1 receptors are present over there. Whereas SGLT2 inhibitors have effect on the pump, the myocardium, and the kidney. And let me remind you that in some earlier studies, actually, GLP-1 receptor agonists had detrimental effects on the pump, and there was actually an increase in heart rate here, perhaps due to an increase in heart rate. All the uh, GLP-1 agonists, if you use them, heart rate goes up about six to eight beats per minute. And as we know across the mammalian physiology, once the heart rate goes up, that over a long period of time may not be a good thing. This, of course, was the fight study in JAMA and the live study over there. But in this CVOTs, there was no increase in heart failure in the meta-analysis, so probably it may be of benefit. So in 2016, actually, after the empiric uh, outcome with my colleagues, we published this paper in Diabetes Care, and we said, can a shift in fuel energetics explain the beneficial these cardiorenal benefits at that time in Empereg, and we called it a unifying hypothesis. I actually made up the term fuel energetics. It didn't exist at the time, but I just put it there. We said that the cardiorenal benefits of empagliflozin, and at that time it was the only study in 2015, due to a shift in myocardial and renal fuel metabolism away from glucose and fat oxidation, which are energy inefficient in the setting of type 2 diabetes, and moves it towards an energy efficient super fuel like ketones, and that improves myocardial and renal work efficiency and function. We were the first to say myocardial and renal fuel metabolism. Eli Ferranini in Italy at the same time in the same journal published, he said it is the heart, this subst uh, you know, it improves myocardial. We said it's both of it. And remember, we said it in 2016. As soon as we published this paper, the, since then, at that time, we did not know anything about it. But since 2016, several studies have demonstrated the beneficial effects of SGLT2 inhibitors on hospitalization for heart failure and also the kidney failure. As a primary outcome across the spectrum of heart failure, HEF-REF, HEF-PEF, HEF-MREF, their benefits are all there. And most surprisingly, in patients with and without diabetes, which really surprised people. And of course, these studies, as you all know, the DAPA heart failure, the emperor with DAPA gliflozin, emperor reduced, emperor preserved with uh, empagliflozin, deliver with DAPA. In stable patients with, uh, sorry, there's a typo there, in stable patients with chronic HEFREF, HEFPEF, and HEFREF. Benefits also seen in patients with acute hospitalized heart failure, not the stable patients. Of course, they were stabilized in the impulse study. And heart failure benefits are also seen with the dual SGLT1-2 inhibitor, which is available in parts of Europe, so tagliflozin in the soloist heart failure and score it studies. What about renal benefits? Well, we know that consistent effects of SGLT2 inhibitors on albuminuria decline in EGFR and progression to end-stage kidney disease, again, as a primary outcome in patients with and without diabetes. Now, that's a little puzzling. Of course, it was the Credence study uh, with Canada flows in diabetes patients, but then the DAPA kidney and the EMPA kidney, it's going to present later this month, actually. We don't know that. We only know top-line results, but the study was stopped early for benefits. Now, one thing is, which has, I noticed it first, the cardiorenal benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors occur very early and was first seen in the Empereg outcome study. This is what led me to think and come up with the hypothesis. How early? Well, let's look, go and look at the, uh, uh, the Empereg. And this is the, prime, the time trajectory. If you look at the time to benefit for hospitalization for heart failure, by day 17, it becomes significant. It's a 90% hazard ratio was, uh, you know, 0 0.10. It's significant at day 17, which drug can do that? Not statins, not blood pressure medications. 
And if you looked at time to benefit for hospitalization for heart failure, CV death, the combined outcome, day 727. And time to CV death alone, day 59. Within two months, it is preventing cardiovascular death. Within 17 days, it is preventing the first thing. And it is significant. So I think this is quite profound over here. Similar changes for renal benefits. And they have been confirmed because sometimes you get a one-off. Actually, when Emperor came, when they presented the results in Barcelona, people stood up and they gave a standing ovation because nobody had ever seen anything like this. Many people said, oh, it's a flu. It's a statistical anomaly. But all the studies are proving it. And let's look at the later studies. This is the DAPA heart failure study, patients with heart failure. Hospitalization for heart failure. Look at the hazard ratio of 0 0.70. That's a 30% relative risk reduction. And if you see that benefits occur very early and when they did it, it's about at 20 days it is beginning to take place. What about the Emperor Preserve study? Again, what you see hazard ratio is 0 0.67. It is significant. Again, occurring very early within about 30 days in heart failure patients over there. Many people say it is due to diuretics. Of course, these drugs are diuretics. You diurese a patient with heart failure, you get benefits. Okay, I, be, I can believe that. But such robust effects have not been seen in any diuretic study. Lasix, of course, now with aldactone in the top cat study, but not so early. Moreover, we know diuretics worsen renal function and so do SGLT2 inhibitors. They drop it about two to three ml per minute. But let's look at the renal uh, this thing, the composite renal outcome in the uh, in the uh, declared to me study, as you can see, the hazard ratio. This is a composite of decline in EGFR of 50%, end-stage kidney disease, or death from renal diseases in the DAPA CKD study. Sorry, I said uh, declared to me. Look at the hazard ratio over there. It is a significant 44% relative risk reduction, but the curves are beginning to separate between the fourth and the eighth month. That's significant. So the question I asked myself in 2016 is, what is driving the cardiorenal outcomes so early? Well, this was in 2016, which uh, the group in Canada said, many mechanisms, as you can see, SGLT2 inhibitors, if you inhibit it, you get metabolic benefits due to glucosuria, about 100 grams of glucose in the urine. That causes a negative calorie balance, A1C goes down, there is more uric acid excreted. Of course, there are hemodynamic, and that will cause benefits. Then there are natriuretic, the hemodynamic benefits. Blood pressure comes down. Plasma volume comes down. And the tubular glomerular reflex is activated, which is beneficial. But in the empiric, now I'm remember, this is in 2006. That also causes benefit. But the negative caloric benefit is, Weight loss is about two to three kilos. They are not like GLP-1 agonists. A1C may be 0 0.3, 0 0.5 compared to placebo. Blood pressure may be two to four millimeters systolic. Plasma volume about 7% down, but after one month, it is not down anymore. And tubular glomerular feedback, yes, but more than 80% of these patients already on ACE and ARBs, which acts on the tubular glomerular thing. Now, it is possible that if you add it all together, it can have ASCVD benefits. That's possible. But it cannot explain the heart failure and CKD benefits, which occur within days for heart failure, within months. This, in my opinion, can only be explained by improvements in myocardial renal tissue hypoxia, which occurs immediately. And I'll explain that in the next slides. But first of all, why should the diabetic heart and kidney become hypoxic? The heart is full of blood, it is pumping. The cardiac output is five liters. The kidney gets about 25% of the cardiac output. They're full of blood. Why are they getting hypoxic? Well, let's look at their oxygen consumption. So this is the oxygen consumption in ml of oxygen per minute per 100 grams. The resting heart consumes eight ml milliliters of oxygen per minute for 100 grams of tissue. So you have about 200 grams of the heart. 
The kidney is not far behind. 5 ml of oxygen per minute per 100 gram. We have about 300 grams of kidney. The brain, 3 ml per minute per 100 grams. But of course, we have 1,500 grams of the uh, brain. So by volume, it consumes more, but this is that. But why are these organs consuming oxygen? What is oxygen important for? Well, oxygen is important to literally burn the fuel and get ATP out of it. So we measure energy efficiency by what we call the PO ratio. That is moles of ATP per atom of oxygen consumed in the electron transport chain. This is like kilometers per liter. If you have a car which gives you 20 kilometers per liter, you've got a good uh, fuel efficiency. Five kilometers per liter, you don't have a good fuel efficiency. Glucose is the best fuel. 2.58 moles of ATP per atom of oxygen consumed in the electron transport chain. Fatty acid is energy dense. C16, palmitate. You get more ATP, but the efficiency is less. It's 2.33 moles per atom of oxygen. Beta hydroxybutyrate, very close to uh, glucose, 2.50. And the biggest, another big difference is when fatty acid is the fuel in the mitochondria, it's a dirty fuel. You get a lot of reactive oxidative species, which causes oxidative stress. Glucose and beta hydroxybutyrate do not cause that. So let's look at a cartoon which shows the fuel. So let, let's look at fuel metabolism in the diabetic heart. So this is what happens. In the diabetic heart, there is metabolic inflexibility. What do we mean by that? See, the heart is an omnivore. It has to beat every minute. It doesn't have a choice. If the heart stops beating, a person's not going to live for very long. So it will use whatever fuel is available, glucose, fat, pyruvate, lactate, protein, amino acid, anything. But it has to switch when between glucose and fat. When we eat, there's plenty of glucose and glucose is the fuel. When we are fasting, fat is the fuel. But in the diabetic heart, they cannot, the diabetic heart cannot use glucose much. Why? Because there is insulin resistance. And there is the Randall's higher cycle, which says that the mitochondria can only deal with one fuel at a time. So when fatty acids are there, it takes precedence over glucose. So the diabetic heart is using less glucose. It is using a lot of fat. That is good. Why? Because fat is available uh, over there. So that's good. But I'll tell you why it's bad. It's energy inefficient because you have a less PO ratio, less ADP. Therefore, that will lead to relatively more hypoxia. And it generates more dirty fuel, reactive oxidative species. And this is a term I put into my paper. I said, Paradoxical starvation amidst plenty. There's plenty of glucose, but the diabetic heart is not able to use it. Insulin resistance is well known in the diabetic heart. And it is using fat, which is not a great fuel and is a, a dirty fuel. That leads to a lot of changes in the heart, remodeling, dysfunction, and pro increased progression to heart failure. And Stephen Neubauer, who's a, he's a very famous cardiologist, in the New England Journal, he said, the failing heart is like an engine running out of fuel. Can ketones help? This is a great article by George Cahill, who in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s did tremendous work on that. And he actually called beta hydroxybutyrate a super fuel, more efficiently producing ATP energy than glucose or fatty acid. So this is a cartoon in which we kind of describe what happens in the uh, th thing. So let's look at the diabetic heart, all right? As I told you, in the diabetic heart, there is increased fat oxidation and less glucose oxidation. That leads to a worse PO ratio, more reactive oxidative species because fat is being burned and less cardiac work efficiency. That leads to less myocardial contractility and there is more incidence and progression of heart failure. So let's see in the non-diabetic heart, because these drugs have benefits in the non-diabetic heart, what is happening? Now in the non-diabetic heart, there is less fat oxidation, there is less glucose oxidation. Then you might say, hey, what fuel is the heart using? It cannot use that. Well, it is using glycolysis. Remember, there is an anaerobic glycolysis. You don't need oxygen for that. 
That doesn't happen in the mitochondria. It happens in the cytoplasm. Why? And that is, in, it's good, but it's fuel inefficient. If you burn glucose completely in the mitochondria, you get about 34 moles of ADP. But if you burn it anaerobically, but, but if you don't have enough oxygen, that's what you do. It's glucose pyruvate and lactate, and you get only two ADP. That, of course, does the same thing. It, it, it you know, inhibits uh, efficiency in the heart. What happens when you give an SGLT2 inhibitor, both in the diabetic and the non-diabetic heart? If you add an SGLT2 inhibitor, you get more ketones, about twice baseline. There is increased oxidation of the beta hydroxybutyrate in the mitochondria. And we know that if beta hydroxybutyrate is the fuel, it suppresses fat oxidation and may also suppress glucose oxidation. That, of course, leads to a better PO ratio, less reactive oxidative species because fat is not being burned, better cardiac work efficiency, better contractility, less progression to heart failure, and now the heart is beating much better. Same thing happens in the kidney. For want of time, I cannot show you that. As soon as we published our hypothesis in the uh, 2016 paper, within one week, a group published in Cell, as you know, Cell is a more prestigious paper than even New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, BMJ. It's a very prestigious. So these two authors from Canada, they said, and Pagliflozin's fuel hypothesis, not so soon. They said a recent hypothesis by Ferranini et al., who talked about the heart and, you know, our group, we talked about the heart and the kidney, proposed that increased ketone oxidation contributed to the effect, but several caveats indicate that the role of myocardial ketone oxidation is far from clear. This paper was just published end of last year, and this really supports our hypothesis. This is from a group in uh, England. And they showed that empagliflozin treatment improves cardiac energetics and functions and reduces myocardial cellular volume in patients with type 2 diabetes. They took 18 patients type 2 diabetes, A1C, A, around 8%. They did cardiac MRI, P31 MRS scan before and after 12 weeks of empagliflozin treatment. Bottom line. They concluded empagliflozin ameliorates the cardiac energy deficient state, which is what we propose, regresses my adverse myocardial cell remodeling and improves cardiac function. Almost exactly what we said. This is six years after hypothesis, offering therapeutic modalities to prevent or modulate heart failure in type 2 diabetes. Can improve fuel energetics alone explain the cardiorenal benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors? Is it just fuel energetics alone? Well, we've learned a lot. There is growing evidence now that beta hydroxybutyrate is more than just an efficient fuel substrate. This is a nice article again in Cell by Peter Crawford and uh, Puchalska. They said beta hydroxybutyrate acts on the NLP3 inflammasome, not like receptor protein, which plays a major role in inflammation and it blocks it. So that blocks inflammation in the heart, in the kidney, wherever. Bilhydroxybutyrate actually has got its own receptors for all this. It's got the HCAR2, that is the, the hydroxycarboxylic acid receptor, the GPR109, and it blocks lipolysis as a feedback mechanism. It also acts through the free fatty acid receptor and lowers metabolic rate, which is beneficial. And this is fascinating. It acts on the HDAX, histone deacetylation, and that has profound mitochondrial changes, also acts through FOXO3 and blocks the stress response in all the organs. And of course, through various mechanisms, beta hydroxybutyrate in all species, including monkeys, can improve longevity. Can we prove it in humans? Very difficult to do a study for 70, 80 years with a diet study, but it's probably true. So in the basis of all this evidence, we, in late last year, we published a new hypothesis, actually updated a hypothesis. And this said, with my colleague, uh, we said a novel hypothesis linking low-grade ketonemia to cardiorenal benefits with SGLT2 inhibitors. And we said there is now evidence that in addition to being an efficient fuel substrate, ketones also impart anti-inflammatory, antioxidative benefits on the heart and the kidney. In addition, they have positive effects on mitochondrial biogenesis function, erythropoiesis, 
they increase red blood cell coin. Thereby, they're able to improve the pro-inflammatory pro hypoxic milieu in those with heart and kidney failure, independent of hyperglycemia. It doesn't matter if you have hyperglycemia or not. So this will explain what happens in people with and without diabetes. So we propose this hypothesis to link the pleiotropic effects of low-grade ketonemia to the cardiorenal benefits. We put a figure in there and I'll briefly run through this figure. So when you give an SGLT2 inhibitor, you block the transporters in the S1, S2 segment. That leads to glucosuria and it's an essential nutrient going out in the fasting state. So if glucose keeps going out, if whether you're eating or not, your sugar will come down to 20, 30 because glucose is continuously going out. And that sets into effect an accelerated starvation st state which increases lipolysis, increases ketogenesis, low grade. I'm not talking about DKA. I'm talking about low grade, about twice basal levels. There's more beta hydroxybutyrate that of course improves fuel energetics, that improves myocardial renal oxygen consumption, work efficiency. In addition, there are all these anti-inflammatory effects through all this antioxidative stress, amelioration of hypoxia, antifibrotic effects, improve myocardial function, and anti-sympathetic effect. That's why the heart rate doesn't go up. Anytime you reduce blood pressure, by reflex, the heart rate will go up, but it doesn't go up in the SGLT2 inhibitor. All of them you know, contribute to improving myocardial renal damage, and there is less heart failure, less progression to end-stage kidney disease. Let me take a couple of minutes to say, why is there ketogenesis with SGLT2 inhibitors? This puzzled me for a long time. It took me about a year to find out. And this is my thing. It is actually a physiological adaptation in fuel metabolism because you're losing glucose all the time. You cannot afford to lose. You're eating and then you're losing it. Your glucose will not stay. It will start going down because at night you're not eating. Most of the day you're eating. Glucose urea, how much? About 100 grams in people with diabetes. And even if you don't have diabetes, and this has been shown, you get about 50 grams if your fasting glucose is around 90. We know that if you have kidney failure, it is less because you're not able to filter the glucose. But even in a person with a glucose about 100 and the EGFR is 30, you will still spill about 10 to 20 grams of glucose. This is countered by an increase in SGLT1 transporters because that takes up 50% of the load. The liver steps up glucose production to supply the tissues which are dependent only on glucose and which are they? the red cells, which have no nucleus or mitochondria. They are entirely dependent on uh, glycolysis. Remember the, the heart, the kidney, the muscle, the brain, they can use ketones, they can use fatty acids, but the red cell has to have glucose. And of course, the inner medal of the kidney, the PO2, the partial pressure is insufficient to support oxidative phosphorylation. It's only 10 to 15. You need about 25 millimeters. As you know, uh, when you do the finger ox, it's about 100 millimeters of mercury. And of course, the brain takes about 12 to 14 hours to shift to ketones. So in the meantime, you need glucose. If all your glucose is going out, SGLT1 transport has helped to take it back and the liver is making more glucose to supply. And of course, the liver is also making more ketones for alt as an alternative fuel because it wants to save the glucose for the brain, the red cell and all that. So with the SGLT2 inhibitors, there is chronic low-grade hyperketonemia, double fasting levels. In those with diabetes, when it has been measured, 0.3 to 0.6. And from 0.15 to 0.3 in those without diabetes and beta hydroxybutyrate is about 75%. The rest is acetoacetate. And these levels, you might say, hmm, it's nothing. No, there are studies which show that even these levels can be significant. And this we wrote in our paper actually is similar to the state of accelerated starvation of pregnancy. Remember, the fetus is fully glycolytic. So the mother, as you know, in pregnancy, there is different standards for diagnosing diabetes. Women and uh, women run low glucose of 60 and they have to eat all the time. Why? They're eating for two people. The fetus cannot use fatty acids. The fetus can only use glucose and it's only glycolytic. There is not much oxygen in the fetus's uh, system over there. The moment the infant is born within, uh, as soon as it is born, 
the free fatty acid oxidation, the enzymes come. That is why in the first week of life, all infants will lose weight. Why? They burn their fat. They are burning because in the first few days of life, the mother's milk, which contains lactose, but it doesn't. It contains immunoglobulins in the first two, three days of life. So infants lose weight. Anyway, so the question is, if beta-hydroxybutyrate per se has beneficial cardiorenal effects, will therapeutic ketosis work? I'm telling you that beta-hydroxybutyrate has got all these effects on inflammation, on oxidative stress, on mitochondrial function. And if you give it therapeutically, will it work? In addition to its fuel effect, what is therapeutic ketosis? So as of today, it is defined as serum ketones between 0.5 to 2 millimolar. I'm not talking of DKA. That's about 5 to 10 uh, millimolar. 0.5 to 2. Remember, if you fast overnight, it's about 0.1, maybe 0.2. If you fast longer, you will get 0 0.4, 0 0.5. But what if we push it up to 0.5 to 2? How can we do that? Well, this concept first was uh, advocated by Dan Kelly and uh, uh, you know, people from uh, uh, Pittsburgh. So how can we get there? How do we get therapeutic ketosis? Well, these are the ways in which we can get therapeutic ketosis. First of all, we can give a ketogenic diet. I'll come into it. We can give medium chain triglycerides, we can give beta hydroxybutyrate, and we can give a ketone ester. Ketogenic diet, you all know. If you eat less than 100 grams of carbs a day, you will start going into ketosis. And if you go less than 50 grams, for sure, it's good. It can decrease body weight, increase HDL. Disadvantage, very difficult to adhere to it. You might deplete your glycogen, run the risk of dyslipidemia. The cost is relatively low and you can get ketones all day. And that's the low carb diet. I've already told you, told you that. It has been used therapeutically since the 1920s to treat pediatric epilepsy. What about medium chain triglycerides? Coconut oil is the best. That's why many people say, take a tablespoon or two of coconut oil because it contains, it is saturated fat, but it is medium chain triglycerides, which is handled completely differently in the human body. And that is a presentation all on its own. And coconut oil, can, the medium chain is C6, 8, and 12. Below that is short chain. Above that is long chain fatty acids. And coconut oil is a rich source, but C8 caprylic acid is really the active part of it. Benefits are seen in weight loss, diabetes, epilepsy, Alzheimer's in small studies, and studies are going on. It has got, we think, great effect, great potential, small studies, but we need to find out. What about beta hydroxybutyrate itself? You can give it as a salt or as an oral preparation. The advantage is it is served in a variety of forms over there. And in one study by Nielsen et al., one infusion of beta-hydroxybutyrate, it improved HFREF patients, improved efficiency, improved cardiac output by two liters per minute. And it was in the range of therapeutic ketosis, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 could do it. Of course, disadvantages are there. You have sodium load, you, you can't, uh, uh, the GI side effects, the cost is low, and the IV infusion lasts for only a few hours. What about ketone esters? This is, you can take it as a drink. You can drink it. It raises it. It keeps your glycogen. Small risk of acidosis, bitterness, adverse GI effects. The cost is relatively high. And you get ketones for about three hours. I've taken it myself. My ketones go from about 0.1 to 1.1 millimolar for about three to four hours. But it's got multiple metabolic benefits in athletes. It's used in all the Tour de France cyclists. It's allowed by the World Doping Agency. Go figure. You can't take erythropoietin. You can't take testosterone. You can take this. And let me give you, the patent for this is held by the University of Oxford and the United States Department of Defense. They apparently give it to the soldiers who have to do all these things. And in 2016, the British Olympic team won six gold medals. Nobody knew how. And then they revealed later that the University of Oxford gave them this drink to it. So it works. It really works short term. Beneficial effects in HFREF has been shown and I'll show you that. But all this is exogenous ketosis. You have to drink it from outside. Endogenous ketosis, how can you get it? 
SGLT2 inhibitors. And we've seen all the, I've told you that it increases it by about doubling. And of course, we've seen all the benefits in the heart and the kidney. And it's the only approved class to, you know, approved to treat hospitalization for heart failure and kidney disease. So I'm just saying, you don't have to go on a low carb diet, intermittent fasting. You can get it by a drink or through medium chain triglyceride, but we have to do the studies which are going on. I'll just share with you, I'll, I'll finish in another two minutes, oral ketone drinks in heart failure. There is a study, this was published in 2021, myocardial ketone body utilization. What did they find? They said, acute nutritional ketosis, if you give oral ketones, enhances beta-hydroxybutyration uh, extraction in patients with HEFREP compared to controls, and this correlates with degrees of cardiac dysfunction and remodeling. But this was the kicker. Acute echocardiographic benefits in healthy people. Remember, I told you the swimmers take it, the cyclists take it. They did a study. And what did they find? Daniel Kelly is there. Multiple beneficial effects on myocardial function, other hemodynamic parameters in healthy adults, similar to that seen in heart failure patients. But we have to come back to our current guidelines to treat our patients. I'll just spend a minute on this over here. As you know, this was just published about two weeks ago. They have again changed the algorithm a little bit. Of course, you all can see it. It's online. You know, the, how do you treat patients with diabetes? Clearly, healthy lifestyle behaviors, you know, support, social determinants of health. But first they said cardiorenal risk reduction in addition to CV risk management. And what do they say? You know, if people have ASCVD, high risk, use a GLP-1 or an SGLT2 inhibitor. If they have heart failure, use an SGLT2 inhibitor. If they have CKD, preferably an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1. Then they said, okay, glycemic uh, ben, uh, you know, management, do that. And of course they said metformin plus combination treatment. And they said avoid hypoglycemia. And you know they recommend the GLP-1 uh, more than the metformin, SGLT2, sulfonylureas. And they said GDPP4 down over there. Of course, weight goals. And they said, avoid therapeutic inertia and modify your treatment every six months. I think we've come a last, long way in the last 100 years. Uh, Elliot Jocelyn is the father of diabetes. And this was his pa paper published in 1916. And his treatment, guess what? There was no insulin a carbohydrate-free keto diet. And then of course, insulin came along in 1923. And of course, the editorial in uh, Lancet was SGLT2 inhibitors turning symptoms into therapy. And Subodh Verma uh, added this. He said the pipe, the pump, the pipe and the filter, do the SGLT2 inhibitors cover it all? Of course, the pump is heart failure, the, you know, and the pipe is kidney, uh, pipe are the vessels, you, and the filters, the kidney, you have effects in patients with and without diabetes. And I think SGLT2 inhibitors have introduced a paradigm shift, not only in diabetes management, but also in the management of heart failure and CKD. I think this is sweet success for the diabetic heart and kidney. And I'd like to put in a plug, at least partly due to the pleiotropic effects of ketones as an energy efficient substrate and through all the effects on myocardial function, Hypox, tissue hypoxia and anti-inflammatory antifibrotic effects. With that, I finish. Thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. It was a wonderful and you know exhaustive session. Uh, we have one Dr. Sangeeta Bandra who has raised her hand. So let okay, me sure. just uh, unmute her for asking her question. One second, please. Yeah, Doctor. Dr. Sangeeta, you can unmute and ask your question. Dr. Sangeeta, you are on mute. If you have noticed, you can unmute yourself and then ask your question or use the Q&A box also. Yeah, I think uh, there is some uh, issue with that. Doctor, I just wanted to check with you. There were a couple of, uh, you know, uh, queries which came to uh, 
our uh, this one uh, through the uh, discussion what is the risk of ketoacidosis okay no i mean i think that's a great question because but i am very specific it is chronic low grade ketonemia i am it the sglt2 inhibitors increase it approximately double your baseline so it is not in the realm of ketoacidosis which is about for sure more than 2 millimolar over there that's point number 1 point number 2 is the people who get into trouble with sglt2 inhibitors are those who go on a low carb diet when i treat my patients i tell them do not go on a low carb diet because guess what if you go on a low carb diet you're going to accentuate that and your body doesn't have a choice it's it, it will get out of control number 1 number 2 other people who get into trouble are those who go for procedures those who are made npo they don't eat or they are admitted to hospital then they don't get enough carbohydrates so you have to be very careful in those patients that you give them enough nutrition give them at least you know most people will give a d5 drip 100 cc per hour where you get at least 50 grams of uh, thing over there so the main thing is don't and when i treat my patients i tell them is don't go on a low carb diet whenever you get sick whenever you have nausea vomiting for whatever i treat it like metformin metformin can cause lactic acidosis i've seen three cases in 30 40 years but i say stop the drug and you know uh, uh, take any other uh, take insulin or call us or come into the hospital over there so the, those are the uh, guidelines which i give my patients and uh, i want to make a point the guidelines in the united states is if people go for a elective procedure or elective admission you are supposed to stop it 2 to 3 two days before because the effects can last that long but that's a great question oh okay thank you so much doctor and there is an attendee participant who has asked uh, questions we have almost three questions now let me just yeah. read it for you uh does the glt2 inhibitor exert more benefit in obese diabetic patient than in non obese counterpart okay that's a really good question i never really thought about that question so far we do not have any head to head or any uh, um you know um specific things but in all the studies which have been done right from emperec to dapa they have looked at the effects in a post hoc analysis those with the low bmi high bmi and its effects are the same across the board but that's a good question where okay. and the weight loss with patients uh, sglt2 is not much 2 to 3 kilos perhaps not like glp ones over there okay yeah. and that question was from dr iklas jini and the next question uh, is from dr sanjaya kularatne what is the best time to give these drugs that's another great question um it has been studied whether if you give it in the evening give it at night give it in the morning dapagrifos and actually we did one of the original studies over there doesn't matter take it at the time which you will remember to take it whichever yeah. is good for the patient metformin on the other hand you have to take it with food right because it causes gi side effects so and in india there are a lot of combination metformin as glt2 so take it with food there's no evidence that food inhibits the absorption of it that's a good question thank you so much doctor and the other question is from dr vinodan sundaralingam uh, chronic low grade hyperketonemia what will happen if we combine with insulin and the glt2 inhibitor that is a really really good research question actually so as we know once you give insulin insulin shuts down ketogenesis it shuts down lipolysis but when it has been studied uh, uh, over here nobody has done in the postprandial state this ketones they are elevated but when you give insulin but we can get the data from the large studies where people with insulin have been studied and there when they do a post hoc analysis on insulin without insulin the benefits are the same because see these drugs act through multiple path, uh, pathways i'm not saying it is purely ketones they are also acting there but there are times in which insulin may go down and these may go up but that's a great research question honest answer is i don't know thank you so much doctor and uh, we have another question from dr george guaran is there a risk for ketoacidosis with sglt2 inhibitor okay so i answered the question now yeah. we can go back to the studies and see very few 
But of course, those are in the studies under control conditions. But let me, if you go to the studies, the upper heart failure study, I think there was one or two or none at all, none at all. And there was actually a study called the DARE study, D-A-R-E, where in the early stages of the COVID uh, pandemic, they proposed that ketones have got pleiotropic benefits and uh, Mikhail Kosibaro did the study and they gave it to acute patients in COVID and they did not see that. They saw two patients had it, but they recovered. It was not uh, uh, any severe. And there were suggestions of benefit even in COVID patients uh, over there, but did not reach statistical significance. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And last question, I think uh, for the uh, day or for this session, what are the benefits of combining SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists? Okay, that's another great question. Uh, actually, uh, Michael Nock and uh, uh, Juris Meyer, they are the two big people from Germany who've done most of the work on GLP-1 receptor agonists. They wrote an editorial in Lancet. They said, GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors, a couple at last. So, but the, it's great because I told you, I think the benefits of GLP-1 is more on the pipe and this is on the pump and you get benefits of both. And the studies show that you get, but are they additive? Are they synergistic? We don't know. But if cost is not an issue, it's a great combination. Cost is a big issue. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Modaliar, for this wonderful session. And a big thank you to all the participants too for taking out time from your busy schedule today. And we hope uh, you have enjoyed this session and learned something new from this McGraw-Hill Author Master class. To help us improve this event, a small survey will appear on your browser once the session ends. Request you all to kindly fill the survey, which would be of great help to us. And thanks once again. And thank you, Dr. Mudaliar. And we are on time. Thanks for all the participants. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste.